I'm going to try to stay brief. I know I'm standing between everyone and beer. There's a couple of speakers after me, so thankfully I'm not last. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the actual platform that we're talking about. And the first thing I want to talk about is the bias that we have toward the term augmented reality. And by bias, what I mean is what you think of when you say augmented reality. And, and I actually heard a couple things throughout the day. This isn't really AR. That's not really AR. Because people in their heads now have a definition. Sometimes those definitions are defined by companies and by the marketers in those companies with an agenda to get you to think of what they're marketing is quote unquote true AR. Really, if you break it down, what we're talking about is as a basis of reality, what your personal reality is, what you perceive to be your world. And augmentation of that reality is to make it larger, to make it greater, to expand that reality. Notice that the definitions of these words don't include anything about field of view, stereoscopic, uh, spatial, slam. Those are self-imposed terms that we've applied to augmented reality. And don't get me wrong, augmented reality demos, we've seen the flying whales, the aliens jumping out of walls, and these are all fantastic demos, but they're not really applicable in your everyday lives. As I'm listening to some of the descriptions, there's amazing development that's going on. I heard about neuroscience and surgery, amazing applications with very limited, very vertical focus and application. And then we had an analyst get up and, and show us the flat line of investment in augmented reality because nobody's really seeing the, the gold there. We have headsets that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. You wouldn't really put them on your head and go out in public. We talk about how AR is going to open up our human to human communication, put on a pair of steampunk goggles and go to the mall and see how your interaction with other human beings goes. My personal bias, my slant, really goes more to the sci-fi end of augmented reality. And the sci-fi interpretation, like here's a great example recently. This is from Spider-Man. This is from the Edith glasses. So we love, we love Iron Man. We love the idea of a heads-up display. Tony Stark leaves Spider-Man, leaves Peter Parker a pair of glasses that give him the power of augmented reality. But it doesn't have slam. It doesn't have to superimpose on the dash of the car or the side of the bus, wherever he possibly is. It gives him information that without the glasses, he no longer has. It gives him control over things that without the glasses he no longer has. And if you've seen the stories, part of the central theme of the story is he loses the glasses, gives them away, and has to get them back because he loses control of his life. Because without these glasses, he no longer has control. So let's talk about glasses. Because as I look at the way people market products, hardware products, augmented reality products, you'll see phrases like, they look like normal glasses just like normal glasses. Well, I can tell you there's glasses and there's not glasses. And if you're taking a technology and trying to wrap it around your head and call it glasses, it's the equivalent of taking burlap and wrapping it around your feet and tying it off with duct tape and calling it shoes. The original invent, uh, <clears throat> invention of glasses goes back almost 800 years. Monks, our first publishing service, had trouble because they were the first people who actually were doing close-up work. Your eye strain starts to go. And if you can't read what you're doing and see what you're reproducing, bad things can happen when you're copying religious texts and other, other things that may be relevant to history. So they created a device that gave them magnification, essentially augmenting their, augmenting their reality in the 1200s to be able to perform the work that they needed to do. As this progressed, we started to solve different focal points. It wasn't really until the turn of the 20th century, in 1900, that, that Teddy Roosevelt started to wear the Nez Pierce glasses. If you think about a picture of Teddy Roosevelt, you never saw him without his glasses on. This is a guy in battle on the top of a horse. You've seen the statues, and he's wearing glasses clipped to his nose. Why did he do that? 
he did that because, and this is a secret for those of you that don't wear glasses, I'm going to share it because um, if you need vision correction, and the more extreme correction that you need, the more this is true, your glasses are a prosthetic device. They're actually a medical device. You need a prescription to buy normal glasses. Take the readers out, the, the cheapo ones at Walgreens or Costco. To buy a pair of effective glasses, you need a prescription. I don't need a prescription for shoes. I don't need a prescription for a watch. This is the only device that we wear. And we would buy these because without them, we can't function as normal human beings. So this medical prosthetic device allows us to get up to the baseline of what quote unquote normal people do. Once you add this device, you can read, you can drive, you can converse, you can recognize people, you can learn new things. And over the course of 20th century, technology improved to improve glasses, but it shifted from just a plain medical device to a fashionable device. And by the 1970s, big brands came in. And we now turn this into more, less of a medical augmentation and more of a fashion choice, still creating that augmentation for our vision, but we're, create, we're giving people the power of choice. What we see, what I see, is that very soon, and I don't believe it's 10 years away, I think it's a few years away, we're gonna have smart glasses that fit these form factors that are designed with this basic architectural premise that leads from an ophthalmic device first and technology second and gives you still the freedom of choice. The real estate of your face is the hardest place to sell a product. People will buy crazy shoes because they have lots of pairs. People will buy a crazy shirt. They might even buy crazy pants. You can make a statement, you wear them occasionally. Most people have one pair, maybe a couple of pairs of glasses. When you choose the glasses that you're gonna put on every day, that becomes your personality, what you say to the world. So now we've improved your vision. We brought you up to a capability of functioning as a normal human being, provided you don't lose your glasses. Um, there's a scenario that I, I typically ask, are you a nightstand wearer? And by that I mean, when you wake up in the morning, do you reach for the nightstand for your glasses? And do they stay on your face until you go to bed and you put them back on the nightstand? People who don't wear glasses, it's a much bigger leap. And this is some of our challenge. And we think about selling devices, that, that compelling use case needs to be so good. The hardest people to sell AR glasses and smart glasses to are people who had laser surgery, people who used to wear glasses and paid thousands of dollars and vowed I will never wear glasses again. And then you show them a pair of magic glasses and they go, no, give me a watch. Now, if we think about these glasses and we think about what we can do with these, the interesting thing is about the time that we started to get serious about glasses around the turn of the century, Frank L. Baum, you guys might know Frank, he wrote a little story called The Wizard of Oz. He wrote a lot of other stories. The one that I really love is called The Master Key. And the Master Key is about a teenage boy who plays with electricity. And he unlocks this, a demon. And I won't give you the whole story, but we'll say the demon gives him a number of gifts. One of the gifts is a pair of glasses. And the glasses that he gives this young boy enable him to look at any person in the in the world and see a letter on their forehead. And that letter represents their personality. If they're a kind person, they'll be a K. If they're an evil person, they'll be an E. So this, in 1900, 1901, the first thoughts of facial recognition and metadata. Now fast forward this. What can we do today with a simple camera the compute we all carry in our pocket, and a private display, I can take all of those people that buy glasses to become normal, and I can give them superpowers. I can give them the ability to recognize people because they're in their social graph, and 
just by seeing their face, I can remind you their name. I can tell you about the metadata of everything in the world because everything around us now has context. We are in the Internet of Things. We may not have it all connected, but we've assigned values to everything in the world around us. And we're hyper-connected so that no matter where I am, my device can tell me what the temperature is, what the weather forecast is. It's reading my calendar. can tell me where I need to be. It can arrange for transportation. It can give me navigation. It can even go beyond that. It can help me with translation. I can read different languages. I can do live translation using a camera and a display. And when I add the microphone and the speakers, I can do live language translation. I can literally subtitle a foreign language, real time. Notice no flying whales, no dolphins following you all day. What we're talking about is taking half the population that's already buying a device. And if you don't buy glasses, I'll share something with you. The average price that people pay for a good pair of glasses is north of $500. And that's usually after insurance reimbursement. And I see people nodding in the room because I usually sort of push toward 1,000. But, but this is not what we talk about today. What we talk about today is stereoscopic and spatial. And all of these applications are really, really important. But I think it's important as we look at the proliferation of AR and we talk about who, where is the pent up demand? Who are the people that are going to benefit most? And I, and I draw a graph when I tell this story, typically. And the graph goes, the more and more extreme your correction, the more you'll pay and the more you'll value this platform. All the way out to the fact that we can do low vision. Right? Steve opened the talk this morning about talking about people with low vision and recognizing edges and being able to read things. We could literally have these read signs and whisper in your ear what that sign says. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. Do you want a dolphin following you around all day? Or do you want to be Neo? Do you want to look around you and see the matrix? Because the matrix is real. And smart glasses are the red pill that will let you see it. Thank you.